Good morning and welcome to another First Baptist Church of St. Paul, Virginia online ministry service. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. I really appreciate you tuning in. Um, thanks again for being here. So now we're at the point where we would normally do our announcements, but unfortunately as it stands, we don't have a lot of announcements. I do have one though. I do have one. So I've gone in and I've updated the church website page. There is now a prayer request form you can go and fill out if you want to have a prayer request uh, sent directly to us. Then there's also a contact form that will allow you to reach out to us um, and we can get in contact with you. Give us your contact info. We'll get a hold of you. So when you have a chance, please look at the church website and check out those two new forms. So as I said, since we don't really have any announcements, please join with me as we sing, Lord, I lift your name on high, and then that will be followed up by the kids clip. Welcome back, everyone. Today I'm going to quote some popular phrases from some famous characters and then one real person. After I say the phrase, I want you to think, do you know who said it? Are you ready? Here we go. To infinity and beyond. Who said that? Buzz Lightyear. Me want cookies. <laughs> Who said that? Cookie Monster. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. Dory from Finding Nemo. Some people are just worth melting for. Olaf said that from Frozen. Was it hard or easy for you to tell me who said what? You have to know a movie pretty well and the characters to match their sayings with the person that said it. If you've never seen Finding Nemo, you might not know that Dory says, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. But if you've seen Frozen like a thousand times, then you're probably going to pick Olaf pretty easily. The more you know a movie and the characters, the better you know their voices. Now I have one more. I'd like you to guess who said, love each other as I have loved you. Jesus, Jesus said that. Jesus is not a cartoon character. He is the good shepherd who takes care of us. Jesus said that his sheep will know the voice and follow him. Now, how will you know his voice? 
Well, he gives us two things to help us. First is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a gift that lives inside of us when we believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit speaks to us with fruits like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. So when you feel inside that you should be kind to someone or that you should be gentle in your response, or maybe you need to show some self-control instead of being a little crazy, that's a way that Jesus can speak to you through his Holy Spirit. That little nudge, that voice inside, that's Jesus speaking through his spirit. The second way is his Bible. Now, when we know scripture, we know Jesus's voice. He's full of wonderful things that he says. And one of the best things we can do is memorize what he has said so that we can hear his voice and recognize him. I'd like for you to pray with me so that we can ask Jesus to speak very loudly to us. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for giving us your Bible and your Holy Spirit so that you can speak to us loudly each day. Lord, we love to hear your voice and we love to be your sheep as you are our shepherd. Thank you so much for all that you've given us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining me for another kids' clip. Now let's sing In the Garden. We've come down for our time of prayer. 
Um, if you all have your prayer request sheets, go ahead and please pull those out. And again, if you're not getting them, please get a hold of us. And now please join me in prayer as we pray over these requests. Heavenly Father, holy and great are you, Lord God Almighty. You are wonderful. You are amazing. You are almighty. You are in control, Lord. You have this all figured out. I pray, Lord, that you look over all of these concerns that are lifted before you today. I pray, Father, you take care of the people that are sick, Lord. I pray that you cure them from their diseases. Take their infirmities away from them, Lord, and heal them. Get them back to 100%, Father. I pray, Lord, that you, you send sympathies and you wrap your hand of comfort in those that have lost loved ones, those that are struggling right now. I pray, Lord, that you take care of them and just wrap them up in your, in your love. And I, I pray, Lord, that they have what they need to get through these difficult times. Lord, you are sovereign and you know exactly what's going on. You are aware of everything that is happening. I pray, Lord, that you look over all of us as we go through these new times and as we look to start getting back to what our new normal looks like when all this COVID-19 stuff goes away. I pray, Father, that you give us discernment. I pray that you would give us strength. And I pray, Lord, that we, we go about how we're handling all this in the right way. I pray, Father, for the leaders of the nations. I pray, Father, for this nation. I pray, Lord, that you protect us and I pray that we are able to, to get through. I pray, Lord, for the people in St. Paul. I pray that you look over them and guide them through this difficult time. And I pray, Lord, that you will put your hedge of protection on the essential workers. I pray that you will put your hedge of protection around the hospital staff, the doctors, the nurses, the the cleaning crew at the hospitals, all the all the people that make a hospital run. I pray, Lord, that you will look over the emergency services, fire and police. I pray, Lord, that you look over the linemen um, and all the essential people that are keeping this country going in this time where we're just now starting to try to get back to normal. I pray, Father, that you protect them and continue protecting them and guide them through this this time, Lord. You are great. You are wonderful. You are almighty, Lord. We love you. And we pray all these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, please join me as we sing, His Name is Wonderful. Oh, oh, oh. 
kindergarten teacher was watching her kids as they drew pictures during art time. As she was walking along observing the students, she came across one little girl that was especially engrossed in her work. She had the little furrowed brows, she had the pencil to paper, she was really concentrating on this art project. So the teacher asks her, what are you drawing? Well, I'm drawing a picture of God, says the little girl. But sweetie, says the teacher, nobody knows what God looks like. To which the little girl looks up at her teacher, puts down the pencil on the desk, and says, well, don't worry, they will when I'm done. Good morning again. I'm glad that we have this time together to worship. So I know I normally do a fun fact about me. This week I asked Dania what fun fact I should share about myself. So this one is from her. She says that I annoyingly, and yes, she used the word annoyingly, will not kill a spider. It's true. Very seldom will I kill a spider. Normally, if one is in the house, I will use the old trap and release with a cup and a piece of paper and send them on their way out in the wild, much to Dania's chagrin. Now, that's not true of all spiders, though. <clears throat> if I were to come across a black widow or a brown recluse, then I'm going to have no problem squashing one of them. And so that's fun fact about me. And so again, I encourage any of you at home that are watching this, if you have questions or if you have comments, or maybe you just want to share a fun fact about yourself, because I kind of feel like I'm in a one-way conversation with myself these days, um, please contact us or send me an email, contact us on the church's website or on our Facebook page, and we would be glad to chat with you. Now, today we're going to be going over more of the Gospel of John. Last week, we looked at John the Baptist and how he falls into Christ's ministry. This week, we're going to have the introduction of Jesus. And when Jesus is introduced, he's, he's called by several different names. And so this week, we're going to look at these various names, and we're also going to look at the calling of the first disciples. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn them to John chapter 1, verses 29 through 51. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who has surpassed me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I watched the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested on him. I didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water told me, The one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that he is the Son of God. Again the next day, John was standing with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned to notice them following him, he asked them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and you'll see, he replied. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about 10 in the morning. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means anointed one. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means rock. The next day, he decided to leave for Galilee. Jesus found Philip and told him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here is a true Israelite. No deceit is in him. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, 
I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe only because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I assure you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, the scripture, it gives us a lot of different titles for Jesus. Now, we as people, we tend to like titles. In Great Britain, one of the greatest honors you can get is to receive the title of knight or dame. But there are also other titles you can get out there. there they have dukes, they have earls, they have viscounts, and they've got barons, and believe it or not, they've got more than that. And so in the Navy, we also use titles an awful lot um, because it helps identify who's who at a command. Now, my kids, they've cautioned me on talking about my time in the Navy because they worry it indicates a deep-rooted desire to stay in forever. And I assure you that's not the case. I don't want to stay in the Navy forever. Um, anyway, getting back to that. Uh, so the ship on the ship, you, you've got your, your primary rank, you've got your primary duty. Um, so when you are communicating with people via email, you will always close out an email with your rank, who you are, what you do at the command. So in addition to these primary duties, we've got what are called collateral duties. And collateral duties, the best way I can say the phrase them or, you know, give you a good definition for it is these are things that need to be done. They're jobs that need to be done, but they're not important enough that we're actually going to hire somebody else on to come on board and do it. So it's a volunteer position that some sailor at the command is going to take. And there are some folks, they will get as many collateral duties as they possibly can because they think it's going to help them during their evaluations and earn that next pay grade. So at the end of that email, in addition to their primary duty and their rank, they're going to list all of their collateral duties. And, and I'm not kidding you. I have seen where you get to the end of one of their emails when they're collecting a lot of these collateral duties and you will have to scroll an entire page just so you can learn everything that they do on board the ship. And, you yeah, know, because they're, they're proud of their titles. They want to know what title they carry. They're, they're going to go out there and they're going to promote that title. Now, Christ, he's got a lot of titles, but he's not the one out promoting his titles. Instead, it's everybody else that are promoting those titles on him. And he's got a lot of titles. And John's gospel is proof positive of that because we haven't even made it out of the first chapter yet. And Christ has already been called the Word the Lamb of God, Rabbi, Messiah, King of Israel, and Son of Man. He has so many titles throughout the scriptures that if we were to list them one by one, it could take up to a half an hour. Just given the name of the title, let alone talking about what these names actually mean. But don't worry, we're not going to go over all of the titles today. We're just going to go over some, okay? So now getting back to the scripture, this recorded event, it happens the day after the Levites confront John as to who he is. So it's likely that some of them were still in the area observing John. Now, rather than say when he sees Jesus, oh, here's Jesus, or here's the one I was telling you about, John instead chooses to proclaim, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, to an extent, this verse sums up the New Testament. It's a very, a very simplistic form that is really the answer that the New Testament gives. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You know, in a very simplistic form, you could say that the Old Testament asks, where is the Lamb? So if you go back to Genesis 22, 7, Isaac asks Abraham, where's the sacrifice? And then remember, Abraham responds to Isaac that God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. So the, New, the Old Testament asks, where is the lamb? The New Testament says, here is the lamb. Now, the specific name, Lamb of God, it combines in one term the ideas of innocence, voluntary sacrifice, substitutionary atonement, effective obedience, and redemptive power 
like that of a, the Passover lamb. Now, interestingly enough, even though the title Lamb of God was common in church history, art, music, and the symbolism of Christ throughout all of Christendom, there are only two books of the Bible that refer to him as the Lamb of God, and they were both written by John. Those two books are the Gospel of John and Revelation. Now, lambs, they were common for sacrifice. Remember, it was lamb's blood that was smeared over the doorways of the Israelites the night of the first Passover. And then every Passover, every family would have a lamb. And then during the course of the year, at the temple altar, two lambs were sacrificed every day. And further, people brought lambs for personal sacrifice. And so these sacrifices, they were good for covering the people's sins. But it wasn't enough to take them away. They didn't get blotted out completely. They were just covered over. And I think that's because these sacrifices, they didn't remove the sin because the lamb was brought from men to men. Whereas Jesus, the lamb of God, is sent from God to men. And his sacrifice will cast our sins as far as the east is from the west from us. So the lamb does not merely cover up our sins. The lamb that is Jesus doesn't cover it up. Instead, he, he removes it from us. He takes it from us. Now, John the Baptist, he clearly understands Christ's identity as being God. In verse 30, he refers to Christ as a man who has surpassed me because he existed before me. Now, this shows that John the Baptist knew of Christ's divinity because physically, John was a little bit older than Christ. And we know this because Mary visits her relative Elizabeth, John's mother, while she's about six months pregnant. So Elizabeth, when Mary enters the room, greets her, Elizabeth exclaims that the baby leaps inside of her when he hears Mary's greeting. And Elizabeth then recognizes Mary as the mother of her Lord. So John knows that he is a little bit older than Jesus in the earthly and, and physical sense, but he also knows that Christ, the Lamb of God, was here well before him. And then after this proclamation, we're, we're given a bit of a glimpse of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove and rests on Christ, showing John the special place that Jesus holds. Now, the Spirit, it doesn't just descend on Jesus, but instead it rests on him. Now, this is an important point, because in the Old Testament, the Spirit would come upon people to enable them to accomplish specific tasks. In fact, earlier, even in the New Testament, we were talking about Mary's visit to Elizabeth. Luke 141, we were told that Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit. But it was just for a moment, though. Now, this is the first time it's recorded where the Holy Spirit rests on someone. So the Spirit rests on Christ. The Spirit remains with Christ. And this fulfills the prophecy that the Messiah would be filled with the Spirit at all times. Now, moving on to the third day, John points out Jesus is the Lamb of God. Again, as, he's, as Christ is passing by, and the two disciples that are with him, they choose to follow Jesus. Now, this is an important point in and of itself, because we could really, we could develop an entire sermon series based on John's action right here. John had disciples, and as soon as he points out who Christ is, two of those disciples they, they leave. They follow Jesus. Because his mission was to point people to Christ and glorify Christ and not himself. So John was sincere in his mission because there's no opposition when his disciples peel off and they go follow the one, the true one. So John's ministry, his, his motive for ministry is true. He is all about pointing glory to God. Now, these two that break off from John the Baptist, they're John, the writer of the gospel, and his friend Andrew. Now, they give Jesus the title of rabbi. Now, rabbi back then, it, it didn't mean what we think of rabbi today. Rabbi means teacher, and it was a very esteemed title because they were considered master teachers. They did not hold the same kind of office that priests of the time did, though, but it was still a very esteemed title to have. 
So they ask Christ where he's saying, and Christ tells them to come and see. And they spend the day with him, and then Andrew goes out and grabs his brother, Simon Peter, to bring him to Christ. Now, the funny thing about Andrew is that we have no recorded sermons of, of what he did in the Bible. There's no, he, he has no sermons. There's, there's no great oratory deals of what Andrew gave in any of the New Testament. But any time he's mentioned in John's Gospel, Andrew is bringing someone. So he brings his brother to Christ. He brings the boy with the five loaves and the two fish at the feeding of the 5,000. And he brings the Greeks who wanted to see Jesus. So Andrew was a personal soul winner and truly his brother's keeper. So he tells Simon, we have found the Messiah. Now Messiah in Hebrew means anointed. The Greek equivalent is Christ. So to the Jews, the title was the same thing as saying the son of God. Now, the kings of the Old Testament, they were seen as anointed by God to be king. And during these times, Israel was occupied. So when they referred to the Messiah you know, in Christ's time, they, they were referring to an anointed king that would deliver them from the Romans and establish an earthly kingdom. Now, to be fair, there was general confusion on what the Messiah would do. Some saw him as a suffering sacrifice, according to Isaiah 53. But others, they thought of the Messiah as a splendid king, like in Isaiah 9 and 11. So it wasn't just confusing to those outside of Christ's inner circle. You know, Christ himself is going to have to explain to his disciples several times that the cross will come before the crown. So it's not a case of the Messiah being either the suffering sacrifice or the king in splendor. Instead, he is both the suffering sacrifice and the king. And then later on, when Nathaniel refers to Christ as the king of Israel, that is another messianic title. In the titling and in the naming in this scripture, Christ refers to himself as the son of man. Now, this is one of his favorite titles for himself. He likes it so much that he refers to himself as the Son of Man 13 times in John the Gospel. He refers to himself as the Son of Man another 83 times throughout the Gospels. Now, this term is another Messianic title, and it harkens back to Daniel 7, 13 through 14, when Daniel records the night visions. And I saw one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given authority to rule and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, nation, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Now, when Christ uses this term, he is identifying both his deity and his humanity. That humanity bit needs to be focused on. One of, one of my favorite parts of the Bible is in Job 10, verses 4 through 5, where Job directly asks God, Do you have eyes of flesh or see as a human sees? Are your days like those of a human or your years like those of a man? Now, in a lot of my Bibles, and I've, I've got a fair amount, um, when I go through that, I, I, you'll, I will write a little note in the margin that simply says yes. Because God will experience, God does experience humanity uh, in Jesus. So the answer to Job's question is in his incarnation. He's here in the world. He suffers pain. He deals with hunger. He deals with temptation. And in the same regard, even though he's tempted and deals with all that, he never succumbs and he lives a perfect life. And he modeled godly living. So Paul Harvey tells about a raw winter night on which a farmer heard a thumping sound against the kitchen door. He went to a window and he watched its tiny shivering sparrows. They were attracted to the warmth of the house and so they were beating against the glass storm door trying to get in the house. So the farmer, he bundles up and he trudges through the fresh snow to open up the barn for these struggling birds. He turns on the lights, he tosses them some hay in the corner, sprinkles a trail of saltine crackers to direct them to the barn. 
But the sparrows, they hide in the darkness because they are afraid of him. So he tries various tactics. He circles behind the birds to drive them toward the barn. He tosses crumbs in the air toward them and then retreats to his house to see if they would flutter into the barn on their own. But nothing worked. He had terrified them. The birds couldn't understand that he was trying to help them. So he withdrew to his house and he watches these doomed sparrows through the window. And as he stares, a thought hits him like a bolt of lightning. If only I could become a bird, just one of them, just for a moment, then I wouldn't frighten them. And then I could show them the way to warmth and safety. And that right there is, is a good summation of the incarnation. So God came to us as a human just for a moment because it was the only way he would not frighten us with his glory and majesty. There's a 33-year period where God lived in the world as a human. And it, it makes sense that, that it happened like this because could you have imagined what it would have been like if God had come from on high? The people would have been terrified. And we know this because instances in the Old Testament when people meet God, some of the first words out of their mouth is, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because they, they hide, because they're, they're afraid of him, because of his awesome power. And so the God of the universe came to us in the most non-threatening way that he possibly could to show us the way. So those are the titles for Jesus. Those are the titles that, that John has laid out for us here in this first chapter. But before we close out, I, I want us to take a look at his first followers. Now, by the end of this account, Christ has six followers. The first two had heard about Christ from John the Baptist, and they promptly leave to follow him. Right? So Andrew goes and grabs his brother Simon Peter, and then Philip is called directly by Christ on his way to Galilee. Philip finds Nathaniel, and so when Philip goes to Nathaniel, he says, Oh, I found the one that Moses wrote about in the law. And Nathaniel's response is to ask if anything good can come out of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth at the time was a very small agricultural town. It wasn't known for a big hustle and bustle or for great advances in education or any of that. It was about 16 miles south of Galilee and nowhere near the Mediterranean. And just as some of us can have preconceived notions about people that come from certain parts of the world, Nathaniel had a preconceived notion, or prejudice like you might call it, about Christ just based on where the Messiah was from. Now, it's a little humorous that Nathaniel would have such a prejudice against a person from Nazareth because he was from the small neighboring village of Cana. But instead of arguing with him, Philip simply uses Christ's words and says, come and see. And so at that point, Nathaniel, he drops his prejudice and preconceived notions, and he goes to meet Christ with no speculation. When Jesus sees Nathaniel, he affirms that Nathaniel is a true Israelite. And what he's meaning to that is it means that he's well-versed in the law, but he also says that Nathaniel has no deceit in him. And that's, that's genuine. He has no deceit in him. Um, but it's not like Christ is saying he, he is sinless. There's, certainly, there is sin in him. We're all sinful. So Christ is not saying that he has no sin or guilt, but instead he's just saying there's no deceit. There's no guile. There's no hypocrisy in Nathaniel. Nathaniel lets his yes be yes and his no be no. You always know where you stand with him. Now, I, I think it's important because this means that Nathaniel is not a social chameleon. So he doesn't change his behavior based on the group that he's with. So as followers of Christ, we should try to be more like Nathaniel. We shouldn't change our behavior based on who we are with. So we should ask ourselves, do we change our behavior based on who we're hanging out with? So Nathaniel, he's honest in who he is. Notice the other people that Christ called. He didn't go out and he didn't seek the priests to follow him. Instead, he gathered a group of men that didn't have any special titles within the religion. They didn't really have any special titles at all. So our last point for today is that, that God, he doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. These men, they weren't equipped when God called them. They weren't given these great skills in oration or going out there and how to properly fish for people. I mean, at least 70 of his disciples were fishermen. So they weren't priests. But from them, the Christian church is going to expand from Israel and will become one of the largest religions in all of the world. 
so why the fishermen? What's up with the fishermen? Why would they be called? But when we refer to them as fishers, you know, they weren't line fishing. They were net fishers. So line fishing is very different. Um, line fishing, it's kind of more relaxing. When I go line fishing, I might just cast my line, prop myself down in a chair, and take a little nap until I feel a tug on the line. But net fishing, on the other hand, it's, it's labor intensive, and it requires a fantastic work ethic, and it requires tremendous persistence and dedication regardless of how the day is going. So we cast the net here, we don't get much, pull it back, cast elsewhere, you know, repeat over and over and over again. And no matter how bad the day was going, they didn't give up. And they weren't the type to give up. Christ surrounds himself with people like that. And so while they might not have had the skills that the priests and the rabbis would have had, they had the willing heart and the work ethic. And then God gave them the other skills they needed to be effective fishers of men. So if you ever feel like you don't have the skills to be an effective witness, you do. And God will use the talents he has already given you for his glory and he will supply you the other that you need in order for you to fulfill his mission. And so with that, we have officially made it through John chapter 1. So Christ, he's got many titles, all of which are messianic. John the Baptist shows his sincerity in his mission when he, when he directs his disciples to Christ. And this chapter is also introducing us to six of the disciples that were not necessarily equipped, but were called by God, and then were equipped to go and do God's will. Now, will, will you please bow your head in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for all the blessings that come from your hand. Holy, 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 mighty, glorious, and wondrous are you, Lord God. You are wonderful and glorious and almighty, and our days should ever be spent praising your name, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this time together this morning. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for sending us the Lamb of God that we could be forgiven of our sins and have all of our sins taken away from us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us an example. Thank you for showing us that you will equip us to go and do your will, Lord. I pray, Father, you look over each and every one of us, and I pray that you give us the, the power we need. You, you embolden us to go out there and be the church and be your hand and feet out there, Lord, and serve our fellow man. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come now to our time of invitation. So if you've never made a confession of Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're invited today. If you want to become a member of our church or rededicate your life to God, you're invited to make that commitment today as well. So please, jo please join with us as we sing Blessed Assurance.
Thank you all again for being here this morning. Thank you for being out there and being the church. I look forward to doing this again with you next week. So in the meantime, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. I love you all. Take care. Have a great week. Bye-bye.